Good afternoon, everyone. <coughs> Welcome to today's professional lunch at the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan. I'm Anthony Rowley, the first vice president, and it's my pleasure to introduce today's um, two guest speakers. On my far right is Ryota Sakagami, who is chief equity strategist at, uh, at um, the investment bank JP Morgan here in Tokyo. And to my immediate right is Hiromichi Shirakawa, who is chief economist for Japan at Credit Suisse Securities Japan, also here in Tokyo, obviously. Um, I, I, when I was deciding which speaker to, to introduce first, I thought, well, we'll go in alphabetical order, which is the fairest way to do it. But then they both begin with S. So what was I to do? So Sakagami comes slightly ahead of Shirakawa, A is before H. So uh, Mr. Sakagami will speak first, followed by Mr. Uh, Shirakawa. Um, Sakagami-san has given his uh, presentation, which you have copies of. Here it's called Japan Equity Strategy, Persistence of Dual Decoupling and Japan Equity Market. Um, Mr. Shirakawa has not chosen to give his uh, uh, presentation a title, but you'll forgive me if I take a little bit of journalistic license in um, describing what they're going to be talking about. Um, obviously, markets are uh, in a period of great turbulence recently. We've had the so-called Trump trade torpedo, and that you know, has suggestions of the danger of trade wars, which in turn might lead to currency frictions or currency wars. We have rising inflation, um, which suggests further monetary tightening in the future, and rising interest rates, and at a time when the world has a, a, a global a debt of, of, um, a mountain of debt rising interest rates might be not a good thing um, apart from that the global economy is in great shape <laughs> um, okay well uh, the uh, sakagami san as i said is uh, chief um, japan equity strategist in the equity research division at jp morgan here in tokyo he joined jp morgan from smbc nikko securities where he'd been chief equity strategist since 2011. he was the top ranked strategist in the nikkei veritas analyst ranking for three consecutive years from 2014 to 2016 and he was the top strategist in the institutional investor ranking uh, for the past two years. Mr. Sharakawa-san, as I also said, is chief economist for Japan at Credit Suisse uh, Securities. Um, he ranked as runner-up in the 2013 Institutional Investor Survey of Analysts and ranked fourth in the 2011 Bloomberg Best Forecaster Survey. Prior to joining Credit Suisse, Mr. Shirakawa was Chief Economist for Japan at UBS Securities, and for 16 years, from 1983, he worked for the Bank of Japan as an economist and as a senior administrator. So I'm going to hand over to our speakers. Um, let me remind you, as usual, to switch off your Katai Denma, your mobile phones, if you have them, or put them on manner mode as a courtesy to our guests. So please join me in welcoming our two guests. Uh, thank you, Anthony, -san, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Sakagami, a Chief Japan Equity Strategist of JP Morgan. And uh, thank you very much uh, for giving me this opportunity to make speech uh, here. Uh, this is my second time uh, the to uh, talk here, uh, and uh, it's a very uh, big honor uh, for me. And today, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, the Japan equity market, uh, the outlook for the Japan equity market, and uh, also uh, the currency and the macroeconomy, or the mainly or the from the viewpoint uh, of uh, the equity market. And uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to show you uh, long-term structure charts uh, on page 11 of my presentation. Uh, and uh, looking at uh, the Japan equity market uh, in the last five years, uh, I'd like to say uh, the Japan market uh, was finally normalized. And the left hand chart uh, that shows the, the EPS, uh, the earnings, uh, and uh, the, the share price. Uh, and looking at that, uh, the, in the last five years, uh, the basically the Japan equity market is driven by the improvement of uh, the earnings. Uh, it's a very normal condition, uh, but the, the, in Japan, uh, the, in the last uh, the two decades, 
or the we or the so the, the big divergence or the between the, the earnings and the share price and basically or the, the share price or the was or the overly valued or the end or the we didn't or the see the correlation or the between the earnings and the share price that's why or the in the uh, last 20 years or the average return of the Japan equity market was so low or because or the market was in the middle of the correction or, and also the volatility or the was so high and so the characteristics of the Japan equity market would was low return and high volatility but finally or the market would was would converged or the to the earnings and would now or the driver or the, is the basically the earnings and looking at the right hand chart or the, the too high level of Japanese price to earnings, or the ones uh, the converged or the to the global average level. And so uh, that's the, uh, the, the structural view and the long term view, or the from my side. And also, or uh, looking at the next page and the left hand chart, or uh, the quality of the, uh, the Japanese uh, the market is also improving, or uh, in my view. Oh, and the left-hand chart uh, is the international comparison of the uh, ROE, and the Japanese ROE or uh, is or uh, the catching up or uh, the to the global average. Uh, the still, uh, the it's slightly lower than the, the other countries, but uh, the comparing with the, the Japanese number in 1990s, or uh, the on average, or uh, that was three percent. But uh, now, uh, the, the Japanese ROE level uh, is uh, around nine percent. And also, the, the looking at the right hand, uh, the distribution of the, uh, the Japanese companies uh, the based on the ROE level, or uh, the now, or uh, the fifty percent of uh, the companies achieved uh, the above. 8% of the ROE. And I think uh, the 8% of the ROE uh, in Japan equity market uh, is a magic number uh, because or uh, looking at the next page, or uh, the left top chart, or uh, is Japan, and these charts are um, uh, the ROE and the price to book matrix. And the uh, Japanese shape uh, is uh, very unique or uh, comparing with uh, other markets. But in other markets, uh, basically, uh, the uh, higher uh, the ROE uh, is followed by the higher price to book. But uh, in Japan, uh, the shape uh, is flat uh, until 8% uh, of ROE, and then uh, the, the ROE level is correlated with the price to book. Uh, and the meaning of this uh, is uh, probably the 8% is the required capital cost. And uh, below this level, uh, the basically uh, the, the ROE, <coughs> the earnings, uh, the didn't work uh, as a factor uh, the for the, the share price. And because uh, the, in this area, uh, the below 8%, or the companies would cannot or the, the meet the, the required or the level of the kept or the ROE or the, by the market. And for the long time, or the Japanese or the ROE level would was or the below eight percent. And that's why the, the Japan market would was only supported by the book value. Or the end or the Japan was regarded as a market for value investors. But now, the majority of Japanese companies achieved uh, above 8%. And uh, that means uh, the, the now the, the, the half of uh, the Japan market uh, is uh, basically evaluated uh, by uh, the level of earnings or the level of ROE. And so in that sense, uh, the also the, from a viewpoint of the quality of the market, uh, the Japanese or uh, the market uh, was uh, normalized, uh, in my view. And based on that, or uh, the simply speaking, or as far as the global economy or the keeps or the positive growth, and as far as the Japanese earnings or is growing, or we can say or the Japanese market or should go up. And indeed, the right hand chart shows in the last five years or the Japanese market is following the trend of the EPS. And we expect the, the another 10% EPS growth uh, for fiscal year 18. Uh, and based on that, uh, the, the EPS would move uh, the following the, the, the gray dot uh, on the right hand chart. And uh, uh, given this, uh, I think uh, the market uh, can go up 
order to 2100 of topics, and that means the, the 26,000 yield of Nikkei. So uh, the, uh, the comparing with the current level, uh, the, uh, that's roughly uh, the 20% upside, and my stance uh, the to uh, the equity market uh, is uh, quite positive or uh, bullish or uh, to uh, the Japan equity market. Having said so, and when I talk with uh, investors uh, recently, uh, many investors are uh, a bit uh, the confused uh, about uh, the dual uh, decoupling. And the dual decoupling uh, means uh, the first one uh, is the decoupling uh, between uh, the long-term yield in the US and also the uh, US dollar. In other words, uh, the, the interest rate differentials between Japan and the US and uh, the, the JPY US dollar rate. Uh, the coupling of these are uh, uh, the source of the, uh, the confuse or the two investors. And the secondary, uh, second decoupling uh, is uh, that uh, of uh, the, the currency and uh, the topics. And in the last uh, the more than 10 years, uh, we saw the, the, uh, the perfect correlation between uh, the yen and uh, the topics. But uh, now uh, we see the big divergence uh, between them. And these two decouplings um, are the, the puzzle uh, the for uh, the investors uh, now. And, uh, also, the, the, these two uh, would hold the key or the, for the future of uh, the Japan equity market. The worst case or the, is or the, the first one, or the decoupling or the, between the, the, the long-term yield and uh, uh, the US dollar uh, the continues. And, but the, the second one or the stops and or the, the turned to the positive correlation. And so this is the worst case. And so the, the further uh, the appreciation of the yen, and also the, uh, the high correlation between yen uh, and uh, the equity market uh, is the, first, uh, the, the worst scenario. But uh, in my view, uh, my view uh, is the opposite to that. Uh, in my view, uh, the correlation uh, the between uh, the long-term yield and the US dollar uh, could come back. But the uh, decoupling uh, between the equity market and the yen uh, would continue. And that's my uh, the view. And I'd like to explain about that. And the firstly, or uh, page one. In the last uh, two years, uh, we saw the uh, reverse correlation uh, between the, uh, the US long-term yield and uh, the dollar index, uh, the DXY, uh, as you can see by the right-hand chart. And I attribute this uh, mainly uh, to that uh, the from the beginning, uh, the US dollar was overvalued. Looking at this chart, or this chart or the, is the interest rate differentials between the U.S. and other countries, and also the, the U.S. dollar. In 2014 and 15, or the, we saw the, the big or divergence between two lines. That means, or the, at that time, or the U.S. dollar was overvalued comparing with the, the past relationship between the interest rate gap and the U.S. dollar. And in the last five, uh, two years, or the mainly, or the, we saw the, the correction of the, the overvalued level of the U.S. dollar. That's why, or the, we saw the, the reverse correlation, or the between in the long-term yield in the U.S. and the U.S. dollar. But now, or the, we see the, the convergence between two lines. And so the, from now on, or the, I think the, the positive correlation or the, would, would come back, and the higher long-term yield in the U.S. Or the, would be or the, followed by the, the stronger U.S. dollar, or the, in my view. On the other hand, or the next page, or the left-hand chart, or the is or the yen and or topics, and we see or the big gap the between two, or the since or the 2017, and the right-hand chart or that shows the, the correlation or the between two is declining, and also or the right-hand chart or the indicates that or uh, the correlation or the between the the Japanese corporate earnings and uh, uh, the yen or the, is also declining. 
And so the background would afford is a decoupling between yen and the market would, is, would also decoupling or the low sensitivity of the corporate earnings or the, to the currency. And the next page, or the looking at or the, these charts, these charts are uh, the contribution of the, the earnings or the by sector or the, to the total or the EPS growth. And uh, looking at this, or the left or the below chart, or the, is domestic defensives. Or the, this sector, or the earnings trend, or the was or the on average negative, or the from or the 05 or the to 2013. But recently, or the, we see the upward trend, and also the contribution of the domestic defensives are or the getting higher. And I think that this would be the, the background for the lower sensitivity of the Japanese corporate earnings or the to the, the yen. Ten years ago, the, the only exporters were driver of the, the Japanese corporate earnings. And or the, so or the, the impact of the currency or the two or the total EPS or the was or the very high. And as a result, the sensitivity of the, the total or the EPS growth or the two or the currency or the was also or the very high. But now, the contribution from the, the domestic sectors are getting higher as a result, relatively, or the impact of the, of the, the, the earnings of exporters are small. Or the end, or that's the background for the lower sensitivity of the, the Japanese EPS, or the two, or the, the currency, or the, in my view. And the next page or the shows that the, the, the inflation, or, or uh, the end of deflation, or the, is the main background or the, for the, the better earnings growth of or the domestic sectors. But under the deflation, or the, it was so difficult to the, for the, the domestic or the sectors or the, to make or the positive EPS growth. But now, or the, at least, or the Japanese deflation or the was over, or the, and the CPI or the turned to the, the positive territory. As a result, or the Japanese companies, domestic companies, or the can hike or the prices. Or the, and uh, that's the, the main contributor to the, e, the EPS growth of or the domestic or the companies. And also that's why the, the right-hand chart or the shows recently or the, we see the correlation or the, between the, the EPS growth of or the Japanese companies and or the core CPI. I don't or the, think the, the Japanese CPI can go up to 2% so easily, uh, but or the, at least or the, that would or the keep or the, around 1% or the, in the coming years. And if so, or the, I think the, the Japanese domestic sectors or the, would or the, achieve or the, the better or the EPS growth, and that would or the, be or the main contributor or the, to the, the Japanese corporate earnings. Uh, so in that sense, uh, I think the, uh, the impact uh, of the currency or the to the Japanese corporate earnings uh, would be much smaller than the past, or the end, or the, the also the, the sensitivity of the Japan equity market to the currency, or the would or be getting lower. <coughs> Based on that, or the, my or stance, or the to the, the equity market, or the ease, or the bullish or stance. That's all from me. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, uh, my name is Shiragawa. Um, Hiromi Shiraga from, from Credit Suisse. Um, I try to be as obje objective as possible today. Um, and already Sakagami-san has um, you know, he's, he's, uh, he, he, you know, shown his own very strong view about Japanese equities. Um, and, and I'm not a um, market strategist. I'm an economist. So I try to be um, neutral and objective. 
And you yourself can think about looking at my charts. First of all, why the yen has strengthened? It is not because of the big change in uh, yen position, why, or at least you know, if you take a look at um, Chicago IMM uh, net yen short selling position, still yen is short sold. And if you take a look at the yen's appreciation uh, in 16, Position correction was significant, but this time around, no. So um, the, the recent appreciation of the currency uh, doesn't look to have been due to speculative position correction. It's number one. Number two, sometimes people talk about repatriation, repatriation impact on the currency. So Japanese investors are now uh, getting their money back from the US and, and to, to Japan, and that is appreciate the currency. But it is also not. If you take a look at the um, Japanese residents' net purchase of long-term foreign bonds, maybe you know, uh, if you do break down geographically, a bit of you know, um, uh, more selling of US treasuries, and that money could have gone to European markets. But the point is that if you take a look at other net repatriation years, like uh, 13, 14, and 17 last year, as of the third week of February, repatriation flow has been much, much weaker. So repatriation hypothesis is wrong. The second point. So why the currency is, is strengthening? And um, I actually use real interest rate differential between Japan and US using expected inflation rates in the bond markets. And now I say um, the dollar yen has got normalized. Normalized means uh, the, over well, the past uh, maybe three years, yen was undervalued. And now yen has become more uh, fairly valued if you use the 10-year real interest differential between Japan and the United States. And in my hypothesis is very simply speaking, this is mainly because of the Bank of Japan's normalization of monetary policy. So um, it's a bit strong word, but the Bank of Japan has or had tried to manipulate the currency as long as possible, as much as possible, but bullets have run out. And now the market is pricing the currency more consistent with some economic fundamentals. Tricky part of this is I use real rates rather than nominal interest rate differential. So the point is the US real rates has come up, but somewhat less than nominal interest rates increases. And Japan's real rates, even though if you take a look at the nominal rates, 10-year, around 0%, real rates uh, is not so positive, uh, not so negative. So differential of real rates has been quite stable. And I would say the yen has been, had to be undervalued, but now become, uh, I think, the more fairly valued. So the, my view is that it is not because speculation, it's not because of repatriation, it is more or less like the market's pricing the currency a bit more in the normal way. And also, um, this is a bit of the, my, my main responsibility for the Japanese economy, but um, my concern, not necessarily, not necessarily a big, big concern, but if I take a look at Japanese monetary base growth and exchange rate, this is nominal, uh, I'm not, taking the monetary base growth differential between Japan and US, sometimes people look at the you know, differential of the growth rate of Japan monetary base and US monetary base, which was originated by Mr. Solos. Uh, I use monetary base of Japan only, but the, uh, there is a trend, which is the declining, not necessarily declining you know, monetary base growth, uh, sorry, declining monetary base outstanding, but the growth of monetary base as a trend has been now very much declining. So the pace of printing money by the BOJ has slowed down meaningfully. And the, that seems to have had some impact on the currency. 
um, the yen depreciation phase seems to have been over in that sense. So again, the simply speaking, um, markets have seen dollar yen in particular or the yen from the viewpoint of the medium term um, cyclical behavior of the BOJ policy, normalization, and more fairly by the currency. And of course, currency has been, or should be affected by many other things, external surplus of Japan, uh, what is the outlook into next year, and so forth. But simply speaking, I'm not surprised to see yen's appreciation over the you know, past uh, year or so, uh, given the uh, cost of monetary policy by the Bank of Japan. And people asking why the US Fed policy is not necessarily affecting the currency pricing. Uh, it's a bit tricky, but again, um, the Sakagami-san used the nominal interest rate, but I, I actually tend to use real interest rates. And from here on, if the US fiscal expansion leading to much faster real GDP growth rate and real interest rates, that should be positive on the dollar, or the yen could start to weaken again. But if the U.S. rates increases, and more on the side of the inflation expectations, real rates may not necessarily rise, and the yen is not necessarily depreciating, or dollar is not necessarily appreciating. So the key is whether or not the fiscal ex expansion of the United States really leading to higher trend real GDP growth in the United States and higher real long-term interest rates. So uh, that that is the the currency view, and. Uh, this is a bit controversial. Um, the, I very much like to look at the shape of the yield curve because long-term long interest rate, in, short-term interest rate differential doesn't matter for credit, credit creation by banks. Uh, we know that U.S. firms become much less inclined to borrow money. However, we still see some credit cycle, and, uh, and um, I'm, I'm looking at the U.S. Treasury yield curve, 10-year, two-year yield differential, and because of the uh, Mrs. Yellen, uh, yield curve has not necessarily get flatter continuously. You, you, you see, you know, some pickup in uh, or the steepening the yield curve in 90s. 13, 14, we call it kind of year input. But then, starts to flattening again. And this flattening trend doesn't seem to be changing. Uh, again, this is related, this is, the very important thing is your call about the fiscal stimulus impact on real GDP in the United States. This is very important. And behind that, you have to have your own assumption for private demand cycle. But anyway, the point is, if the long rates are not picking up, short rates picking up because of the Fed policy, yield curve will not get steeper, continue to s flatten. You're going to see um, some you know, downward impact in the pipeline, in the economy. Credit cycle may go, go down the thousand. And interestingly, um, this flattening of the curve in the U.S. Treasury yield and effective dollar depreciation sometimes happens simultaneously. This is a very much economist type of hypothesis, but this um, seems to be something which is the flattening of the curve and, and dollar depreciation seem to suggest that markets start to price in, slowing down the US economy not now, not next year, but maybe into 20 and 21. The lag wouldn't be that stable, um, but um, I think the, we saw depreciation dollar, a flat in the curve, all cut simultaneously in five, six, and seven. And eight, we had a crash. Uh, I'm not saying that because we don't have much of the, those experiences in the past. But as long as if you take a look at the experience between 2004, 5, 6, and, and 8, um, simultaneous uh, the um, observation of flattening of the curve and yen depreciation means something. 
I would like to see the U.S. yield gap to get steeper again. Fed become somewhat less um, hawkish, and the market's pricing in continuously the fiscal stimulus. If the yield gap gets steeper, dollar would strengthen, or risk risk on would be coming back. Uh, so we are very much you know, focusing on the shape of the yield curve and movement going forward. So that, that is, I think, the uh, very broad view. And again, I'm not a uh, market strategist. So I'm, I, and I also am not responsible for making a call for the dollar yen or interest rates um, or even US economy. Uh, but the one possibility is the yen continue to strengthen uh, because it doesn't have any um, strong, strong, I think, threat to counteract to Yen's appreciation. Uh, but I, I, I tend to agree with sakagami san on the Japanese equity market situation uh, because the, we have seen very, very strong profitability of Japanese companies. So um, I would say the as long as the U.S. US market is doing quite okay or strong and U.S. economy does okay, um, uh, I think um, unless unless the uh, U.S. economy and markets go down, uh, Japanese equity markets would be behaving uh, quite well. Uh, but I think the currency, uh, I don't know. I mean, the, there's a risk. Uh, if this trend continues, uh, the yen could be strengthening further. Um, and our, our, our current house view is 105 yen, not a big difference at the end of the year uh, from the current level. Uh, but definitely we are not saying the yen is weakening uh, meaningfully from here. And yeah, I can stop here because, uh, you know, sh shorter is better maybe. Yeah. Thank you very much, both of you. <coughs> You've both given what, what I think I would call very rational and cool, calm presentations. Um, so if I may, before I open the floor to questions, I'd like to ask you whether uh, the, the factors that I referred to at the beginning of my, uh, of my uh, introduction when I said that markets obviously have some real fears at the moment, uh, Mr. Trump's um, trade uh, tariffs, which uh, it's widely speculated could lead to trade wars. That will have an impact, presumably, on currencies. Um, we do have a situation of rising interest rates in the US and elsewhere, which is um, possibly going to cause um, problems with debt. So um, are you not concerned about these, these factors? I mean, when you look at these things, they really do seem to be quite alarming in some respects, especially the tr possible trade war. Does that not play into your calculations about where markets are going to go? Uh, Thank you very much. And uh, I think so far, uh, the impact uh, of the either Trump's policy uh, would be limited uh, to Japanese companies. Uh, and uh, based on our analyst calculation, uh, the impact uh, to the, the Japanese uh, the companies, especially uh, the, uh, the autos uh, and the machinery, uh, the mainly uh, the make products uh, the in the United States and imports or uh, the, uh, the steel or uh, the from uh, the Japan or uh, other Asian countries or uh, the impact uh, on uh, the earnings of uh, the, these sectors uh, roughly or uh, the one to three percent of the recurring profit or uh, in this year uh, and uh, that would be or uh, the very limited impact or uh, the so far and uh, from uh, the long term perspective uh, I think uh, basically or uh, the, the what Trump is doing or uh, is inconsistent. And uh, so uh, I mean uh, the, the tariff uh, the is, um, uh, the would be a factor uh, the for the higher inflation rate uh, the in the United States. And also uh, the fiscal spending, big uh, the, um, fiscal spending is also the, the factor for the, uh, the higher inflation rate. And the uh, higher inflation rate uh, usually uh, will be uh, followed by the higher long-term yield uh, or higher yield. Uh, and uh, the would be a factor uh, for the, the stronger currency. Uh, and uh, so that would be uh, the negative uh, to the, uh, the exporters uh, in the United States. 
Uh, and if uh, the currency uh, doesn't uh, appreciate, uh, in that event, uh, the basically the inflation rate uh, would be much higher. And uh, that would be negative uh, to the, the, the domestic economy. Also, in that sense, uh, I think the, the, uh, the current uh, the policies uh, the, by uh, the Trump administration uh, is inconsistent and uh, uh, that would not uh, the have uh, uh, the long term impact uh, the, to the economy, or uh, in my view. Yeah, I think, um, uh, first of all, the, um, our biggest focus right now is on uh, car trade. Um, steel products and aluminum-related tariff um, would not necessarily affect much the Japanese exports to the United States. Um, the, the concern, of course, again, relates to the uh, car trades or car-related exports from Japan to the United States. In, uh, back in 1981, if I remember correctly, under Reagan administration, uh, there was a strong, strong pressure to Japan. And Japan actually uh, introduced uh, self, yeah, voluntarily, yeah, voluntarily cap on the car export to the United States, um, initiated by Japanese car industry. That time, I think 1.6 7 million car to the United States, maybe, if I remember correctly. But anyway, slightly lower than 1.7 million cars. Um, Japan's export to the US in terms of the passenger cars last year was 1.76 million something. So, um, and very, very stable. But, uh, you know, the number hasn't, hasn't declined since maybe around 10 years ago. Um, so the the issue is whether or not the car exports of Japan to the U.S. Uh, become a really focus among us two countries' trade negotiations going forward. Um, I I do not think the that going to be a big issue for the moment, mainly because of the um, regional security issues. Uh, Korean Peninsula issue and so forth, um, but of course we have to prepare for some risk. Um, but I think the, getting back to the fundamental, the problem of the global economy is the uh, very stubborn U.S. deficit, twin deficit, uh, trade and uh, fiscal deficit in the United States, and in particular in Europe, huge external surplus, Japan as well. China has somewhat corrected their press up press, but Japan is running the right now 4.1% uh, of GDP of current surplus. Germany is like 8% of GDP of surplus. So trade frictions would, I would say, would not easily go away until price or exchange rate adjustments become really visible. So euro has become stronger. It has become stronger, and. Is this really leading to some correction of the two, two or three, three legions imbalances? May take time. Uh, Japanese companies are still quite, um, uh, you know, they, they could be profitable uh, at 105 yen to dollar, and price effect would not be that strong. And and also, um, as I mentioned, U.S. could buy more things because fiscal stimulus. So how how you know we gonna we gonna see a correction of the imbalances, uh, only a minor change in the exchange rate levels. So if tariff story is gone, may, more, maybe more focus on the exchange rate. But remember that at the 80s, we had a voluntary uh, cap of export to the U.S., but still Japan's landing huge surplus. And then what? Plus our court. So, a bit of a worry in that sense. So far, it should be okay, and I don't think that could be happening again, but the Japan has to be responsible for, at least to some extent, you know, reduce our, our imbalances, uh, but how we can do that, because the fiscal situation is quite uh, already, as you mentioned, the public debt is still very, very big, and so forth. And BOJ's monetary policy cannot exist. Domestic demand or imports, usually BOJ's monetary policy tends to stimulate exports rather than imports. Um, so that, that, that issue. Yeah. Thank you. OK, let's open the floor to um, 
questions first from the working press. Uh, questions from the working press? Um, if there are not, uh, any others who... Uh, Keldon, do you have a question? Sorry, yes, go. Thank you very much for your presentation. I have a question I ask him all the time. I am Azari, I'm correspondent for Panorite News and uh, some media in the Gulf where they sell oil Japan. So I have some income in yen and in dollars. So <laughs> if you are in my place, what would you like to get? Salary in dollars or in yen, <laughs> or uh, their third choice now, uh, crude oil also possible, <laughs> if I have a refinery. But seriously, we, we really want to know where the yen is going. Are we going to see another 70 yen for the dollar sometime soon, especially if the so-called trade war escalates? Thank you. I should mention that Mr. Ansari is the president of this club, incidentally. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I'd like to show you or uh, yeah, the left hand chart uh, of my presentation material and uh, I used to, to work as an economist, and so uh, the, I'm now uh, the market guy, but uh, basically uh, the, my background is uh, the economic fundamentals. And uh, based on this, uh, the, my view uh, from a long-term perspective uh, the, is uh, the very much fundamental view. Uh, and uh, I think the, the still uh, the purchasing power parity uh, the, would be uh, uh, the important factor uh, from a long-term viewpoint or the regarding the, the currency. In the left hand chart uh, the, is the, the divergence uh, the, between the, the actual uh, the, uh, the rate uh, against the US dollar uh, the, and uh, also the, the purchasing power parity. And, um, Positive number or the means the, the currency or the, is overly valued uh, against the US dollar, and the negative number or the, is uh, undervalued. And looking at this, or the Japanese uh, the yen or the has been or the overvalued or the around or, or since or the 2011 or the to 2013. And so I think or uh, the 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 bio, the impact of the first BOJ's mandatory or the easing or the by or the Mr. Kuroda was the, the trigger uh, the, for the normalization of the, the highly uh, evaluated yen or the to the, or the normal level. And uh, that mission or the, was completed or the, in 2014, but the, the BOJ eased the mandatory conditions further or the, in the second half of or the 14. And uh, as a result, uh, in the short term, uh, the Japanese yen uh, was uh, depreciated further uh, to the undervalued level, but it, uh, that was uh, followed by the too strong US dollar uh, and also the, the weak emerging currency. Or the end, or the weak emerging currency was followed by the, the drop, uh, the uh, emerging currency, and the strong U.S. dollar was or the followed by the drop of the commodity prices uh, in the world, or, and the strong U.S. dollar, or the weak emerging currency, and uh, or the weak or the, or the commodity prices or were uh, the background uh, for the, the slowdown of the global economy, or the, from the beginning of 2015, and the, or the global market would uh, turn to or the risk off or the, in the middle of 2015 and the yen or the started or the to or be to uh, come uh, uh, to uh, appreciate it again or the to or the beginning level in that sense or the, I think or the, in the short term or the currency intervention or the monetary policy or the manipulation of the currency or the, would work but the, the, from long term viewpoint, or the basically or the or the currency or the, is converged or the to the fundamentals and the purchasing power parity. Uh, and so in that sense, or the, I think the, the current level of the yen or the, is or the the lovely or the fair value, or the basically. Uh, and uh, uh, the, in the future, 
or the basically the in or the inflation rate gap would between or the Japan and the US or the would or the be the uh, the key factor uh, the for the the, uh, the currency. And so in that sense, uh, the, I think, uh, the, of course, the U.S. inflation rate or the would or the accelerate, but at, uh, at the same time, or the Japanese deflation or the, is finished, or the, and uh, uh, the, given the, the current or the very tight labor market uh, and aging population, and so the Japanese supply side would, would shrink would continuously, or the supply demand or gap in Japan would narrow or the continuously, and that would be a factor for the acceleration of the inflation rate in Japan. And uh, so in that sense, from long-term viewpoint, or the, I think or the yen or the would weaken or the further uh, uh, based on that or the inter, or the gap of the, the inflation rate. And so the, I recommend or the, uh, you or the two uh, get your salary or in the US dollar. Yeah. Do you have a comment? Yeah, I think um, the, uh, the issue is whether or not Japan, um, well, to resolve the Japan's fiscal problem, uh, we, we really need a significant inflation, why not? Or, um, you can put it this way, um, this fiscal situation would inevitably require um, significant price level adjustments on the upside or huge inflation. Unless, well, without that, Japan cannot get out of fiscal problem. If you think that way, yen has to weaken, definitely. Almost, almost impossible for the yen to stay this level. So. In a forward-looking way, um, it, it is again up to the fiscal sustainability. How you're gonna, how you're gonna uh, assume your, your, um, the, uh, uh, well, um, your assessment of the fiscal situation of Japan and so forth. Um, a bit of egg and chicken, but um, uh, if the inflation is the only way to resolve this huge fiscal problem. Definitely, yen has to weaken because, you know, from even PPP kind of arguments, yen has to be much weaker. Uh, but in a backward-looking way, uh, from PPP perspective, for example, Japanese inflation rates have been much more stable than the United States. We're still running the over savings, external surplus, huge accumulation of external assets. Yen cannot easily weaken. So in the back of looking way, I, I always think that if I talk to, for example, you know, people from Singapore and people from Hong Kong, I always say, can you eat, can we eat um, ramen, for example, um, in, in Singapore? Um, if the current exchange rate, like, you know, 100 yen to dollar. Five bucks, almost impossible. If you go to Singapore, if you go to the Japanese ramen shop, they sell thirteen dollars. Means yen is hugely undervalued from that sense. So people tend to feel from from the other side, you know, other side of the uh, globe or somewhere outside the country, they're coming to Japan and eating things. And, wow, everything is very cheap. Yes, our currency is cheap. I always think that it's not a big mark type of PPP, but I think the, I, I tend to say, you know, ramen PPP, 50 yen to dollar. So, of course it's not the whole economic story, and you know, exchange rate variation is of course not different from the, those big mark PPP or the ramen PPP, but I tend to think that from macro perspectives, again, we're still over saving situation, learning surplus, Remaining fairly high competitiveness in terms of the pricing of Japanese firms and continuous accumulation of the net external surplus, why the currency st starts to depreciate from here. You have to have very strong assumption going forward. Even with this big, big assets of us, this country will default. And inflation would be coming. And the yen, phew, right? 
So my recommendation for the moment is, um, why don't you do 50-50? <laughs> when you become really, really confident of the Japanese government default, you can switch from 50-50 to 0 yen and 100 dollar. Yeah? <laughs> Süddeutsche Zeitung Neidhardt, uh, to follow up to this, uh, what you just said, Shiokawa san. Um, if we have a significant inflation, don't, doesn't the BOJ run the risk of having a negative balance sheet? So the, the BOJ would default too, and what happens then? Uh, well, um, I, I think the, um, first of all, uh, default and significant increase in interest rates or JGB yields Decline price of JGBs, um, not because of the accounting, but because of the yeah. I think the kind of implicit mark-to-market accounting BOJ may land, may land a huge net negative capital position, and that would of course you know they even put a down pressure on the currency and 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 also the value of the our banknotes go down, inflation picks up and so forth. Um, the, the, the question is whether or not that inflation really helps the fiscal sector. Somewhere at some point, if there's a case, JGB price decline would stop. Of course, it's a timing issue, right? But I think the, the, the question is, is really this sort of inflation helps the government? And one big assumption is we have to have the spending side uh, fixed in terms of nominal value. For example, pension and so forth. Then huge improvement of the government because revenue jumps, spending fixed, means real income over us, pension, everything, hugely goes down. And definitely you know, by definition, significant improvement of the fiscal situation. Maybe government can easily land fiscal surplus. And then you know this process will stop and temporary net negative capital position, but I think the, that issue not be that big. So this is again, the dynamics is very important. Uh, the fiscal, you know, again, you know, the, the issue is whether or not the inflation really helps the fiscal, fiscal uh, uh, authorities. And in our understanding, uh, tax revenue sensitivity to inflation rate is fairly significant, and usually bond yields response is somewhat less, means debt services cost increases sometimes, although almost always, you know, less than tax revenue increases. But what we do not know is if the huge shock happening on the, on the inflation, market reaction could be different. Uh, but uh, we are not necessarily that pessimistic about this mechanism because inflation picks up, let's, let's say like from zero to like 5%, for example. Tax revenue may be increased by 20%, 30% quite easily. And if they, unless the inflation, unless the interest rates goes up above like 10%, should be okay. But nobody knows. Uh, that's why, that's why the Japanese authorities have not yet learned risk of those significant price adjustment type of policy. And if you take a look at Abe administration, even though they say deflation is needed, but look at them. They stick to VAT hike. They are more interested in spending reform. And BOJ is quite uh, cautious in Introducing helicopter type helicopter drop of money type of policy action, and trying to buy time, buy time, right? And everything's stable and so far it is quite okay. Um, but anyway, uh, the I'm not necessarily uh, uh, that concerned about the Bank of Japan's net negative capital position uh, at the moment. If you assume inflation. Is not necessarily leading to the huge, huge collapse of the bond markets. Is there a legal problem if the Bank of Japan's balance sheet would be <clears throat> No, I think the capital injection is possible. And yeah, I think it is, simply speaking, you know, 
uh, legal, there's no there's no legal problem. But I think one thing is that the BOJ law now defines the central bank's capital of 100 million yen. So if they do want to increase capital, issue stocks, or borrowing money from, from the government in particular uh, as, a, as a form of equity, they probably need, need to amend the Bank of Japan Act. But it can be done. Okay, san do you want to say anything on that, or should we pass on to the next question? That's okay. Next. Okay, next question then. Um, yes. Sorry. Yes, it is. It's open. Sorry, I'm not a big pardon. Yes, but I did recognise you. But please. Yes, it is open. Yeah, my name is Kurt Sieber. I'm an associate member. I'm also a good customer of uh, Credit Suisse in Switzerland. <laughs> um, I have a, a hot, <laughs> hot question. Um, my Grandmother emigrated from Germany to Switzerland in the 1920s. And uh, when I visited her home in Switzerland, she uh, had one of her rooms uh, using billion mark Reichsmark as a tapestry. Uh, so that brings us to the subject of hyperinflation. Uh, hyperinflation uh, is, uh, well, everybody tries to avoid the subject, I know that, and, uh, but um, still my question is, uh, in that sense, is what happens if um, things are really running out and we have, like in Germany, one egg costing 323 billion mark? Thank you. I have a second, a, a more simple question. You, you covered very well the uh, the dollar uh, yen situation, but there is another big um, currency in the triangle, and that is the uh, euro. Uh, how do you see the euro in this triangle uh, at this time? Thank you. Is your question addressed to Uh, thank you. And uh, the first three, or the, still, I think the, the hyperinflation, or the uh, like uh, the Germany in 1920s, uh, the, is uh, unlikely, uh, the, because uh, the now or uh, the central banks uh, the can tighten uh, the monetary conditions uh, the easily, or the, if the, the inflation rate or the accelerates uh, the significantly, and also or uh, in Japan or uh, the. The risk uh, the, is the, the huge amount of uh, the debt outstanding uh, of the government, and uh, but uh, still, uh, as you know well, uh, the, uh, the major part of the, the govern uh, government debt uh, is financed uh, by uh, the Japanese people, and uh, the, as a total country, or uh, the Japan is a net creditor uh, the, to the overseas, and so uh, on the net basis, or uh, the capital flight uh, is unlikely, and so the. I think the, the vicious cycle of the, the weaker currency and the capital flight and the higher inflation, or the vicious cycle of this or the, would be the way of the, of the, the, uh, the hyperinflation. But uh, uh, the, for the moment, uh, the, uh, it's unlikely or the, the for or the Japan, or the, because of the, the uh, because of that uh, Japan or the, is a big or the owner of the financial asset in overseas. Uh, having said so, as I mentioned before, uh, the current or the supply demand condition or in Japan or the, is so tight, and the Japanese people or the, has a mentality of deflation. Or the, but the now, or the Japanese supply demand gap or the, is or the, in the positive territory, and the unemployment rate is 2.4 percent. Or the still, or the, or the majority of Japanese companies or the reported the shortage of the labor force. And and uh, that means, or uh, I think, or uh, the, the tighter uh, the supply demand conditions would be followed by the, the higher inflation rate. And um, so, in that sense, uh, I don't expect the, the hyperinflation, but uh, uh, the 
I think the, the in the future, or the Japanese inflation rate, or the could be, or the much higher uh, than now. Okay, thank you. So I'll try to get one more question. So, um, euro. Uh, uh, regarding uh, the the euros, or uh, the the now, uh, the, I'm not so. Uh, Focusing on all the euros, or in the last or the three years, or I focused on all the euros, or the because, or the in 2014, or the ECB also implemented the the easing or monetary easing, and the euros also or the depreciated or the significantly, and so or the both the BOJ and or the ECB or the world in the background would afford the strong US dollar or the since the 2014 or in my understanding, and in 2015 or the Japanese yen returned to the the. The, uh, the former level, and but the, the euro or the continued or the weak level or the against the US dollar, and so or the, the divergence the between the, the, um, the interest rate gap or on the right hand chart or the, and the, the US dollar or the continued or the in or the 16, or the, but uh, now or the, as a result of the, the, uh, the appreciation of the, the euros or the, in the last year, uh, the also the, the euro or the turned to the, the fair value, I think. And so the, from now on, or the, that would not be um, uh, the big issue, or the, in my view. Uh, I think the issue is not, in, in my, my sense is the inflation is, of course, you know, the uh, um, price, uh, Positive price price level changes. Um, I think the issue for Japan is the how we can wipe out net debt of the consolidated balance sheet of VOJ and and, and, and the government. And actually, um, in in my current calculation, VOJ government consolidated uh, net liability is roughly speaking six hundred trillion yen. And we have to have some several assumptions, but uh, if you do want to wipe out the 600 trillion yen of the net debt position of the consolidated government sector in 40 years, you have to have 15 trillion yen of the fiscal surplus every year. And 50 trillion yen of fiscal surplus every year, um, assuming the unchanged spending, tax revenue has to increase has to increase by 50 trillion yen uh, from around 60 to 110. And that should require, in our calculation, jump in price level by, roughly speaking, 25% today. It is not a 25% of increase in price level in 40 years time. Because the calculation, why it has to jump today and 40 years, and then we can, we can uh, wipe out this net liability position of the government. So this is a price adjustment issue rather than inflation uh, in, from that analysis. So we need a, roughly speaking, a jump in price level 25% today for everything, for eggs and crows and cars and uh, and our pay as well. If, we, if our pay doesn't increase, huge um, real parts in power deterioration. But anyway, this is an image. This is an image. So um, I don't know the, uh, uh, what do you mean by hyperinflation? Of course, you know, that's a kind of, you know, it's not like 100% inflation we need it, but I think the 25% adjustment of price level is needed. Uh, assuming the very stable uh, spending and interest levels and so forth. And assuming uh, potential GDP is not picking up much. So, um, I, I tend to think that this number, like 25% price increase, what is happening to, well, if this is the case, if you price in this today, are you, are you buying things? No. You cannot store food products for the coming 40 years. How are you gonna hedge your position? By buying stocks? by buying properties <coughs> or by investing cryptocurrency. So 
I think the, uh, in that sense, I totally agree with sakagami about his bullishness on the equity price because the equity price should continue to go up. Because everybody, you know, if I were, if I were a Japanese national uh, expecting this uh, price level adjustment into the future, why we, why we hold deposits, cash, and so forth? It's crazy, right? So uh, again, this is the number. And I don't think the hyperinflation, I, uh, it depends on your definition, but the point is we have to hedge our financial portfolio quite aggressively into the future. Okay. I'd like to take just, we are up against time, but I'd like to take just one more question, if that's agreeable. Peter. Uh, hello, it's, um, my name is Langan. I'm at the moment working freelance. Um, I have a few questions actually, so I guess if we don't have time, you can choose as you wish which ones to take. Uh, this trade torpedo that Anthony brought up, um, we've had talk now as we had with Japan in the past when in trade conflicts with the US about the, the treasury torpedo. Japan at one time was the biggest creditor, I think. That's now China, last time I, I asked. Um, so as this escalates, have, you, have your houses sort of ran out worst case scenarios of what trade might do to the global economy? Uh, considering we'd no, we've had Trump for more than a year, we know his views, what are, you, what are your worst case scenarios? Um, Mr. Shirakawa, you mentioned the run up to the Plaza Accord and how it took place. Um, it seemed to me you were suggesting that that could happen again. So who would be on the other side of the table this time with the US? One we'll would presume it's China. Um, in uh, various um, press conferences I've attended with various economists talking about Japan's economy, they all say over and over and over and over again, it's wages stupid. And yet, you know, we still have this problem of wages in Japan in order to you know, attain any inflation targets have not risen as seemingly Mr. Abe would like. And a final question. The China Congress taking place right now, they've just announced 800 billion won of tax cuts. I don't know if you've had a chance to look at that or if you do look at it, but do you see what that, have any view on what that means for the world economy or China's economy, et cetera. Thank you. Okay, well, we may have to prioritize those a bit. So can we start off with the trade torpedo, the worst case scenario? What could be the worst case, according to your projections, that arises from trade friction? Briefly answer, if you don't mind. Mr. Chairman, hmm. isn't the meeting at the 2 o'clock? No, it's about 30. Oh, it's, sorry, I apologize. It's, it's off. <laughs> <I'm> sorry, <laughs> sorry, relax, and all think of uh, plenty of questions to come. Uh, by all means, answer all four questions then, if you could. <laughs> so first one was tra trade torpedo. Trade torpedo, worst case scenario, starting with you, sir. Uh, yeah, uh, the, we haven't done the work uh, the, uh, the to uh, the make the, uh, the scenario analysis uh, the, uh, the on the trade wall, uh, the, but um, mm, in my uh, scenario, or the, I think uh, the the higher tariff uh, by the U.S. Uh, the, uh, would be or the followed by the uh, the higher cost or uh, the in the uh, the making products uh, in the U.S. Uh, the, and uh, uh, that would, would be passed to the, to the consumers and. Uh, or the, or the would be either followed by the higher inflation rate and the uh, long term yield or the in the US or the would rise or and would also the Fed or would hike or the or the rates or the or in the high pace. And uh, that in that event or the so or the that's a kind of the the cost push inflation or the in the US. And the uh, cost push inflation would not be necessarily or the positive or the to the, uh, the corporate earnings. On the other hand, uh, the higher long term yield uh, would be negative or the to the, uh, the equity valuations, but especially the, uh, the US or the, uh, the equities or the, the price to earnings valuations expanded uh, the significantly or uh, under the condition of low interest rate. 
And so or the higher interest rate or would be followed by the, the, or the correction of the, the valuation of the U.S. equities. And uh, that or the, would be uh, the collapse of or the, the U.S. equity market, especially or the fang type of or the growth or the stocks or the valuation would shrink or the significantly or the, the under the scenario. Or, and so from a market perspective, or the, I think that, that would be uh, the, the worst case. Uh, and uh, the regarding the, uh, the impact to the economy, or the, I'd like to or the, pass the button to Shirakawa-san, but uh, uh, regarding the, uh, the, uh, the wages uh, the, in Japan, uh, I think uh, the, the very important factor for the Japanese or uh, the wages uh, on uh, page 10 of my uh, the presentation, uh, the recently uh, the we see the, uh, the upward trend of the year-on-year -year changes of uh, the regular employment. And uh, in the last year, uh, the Japanese part-time workers' ratio stopped to rise. I think that this is uh, the very uh, important change of the Japanese or uh, the labor market because uh, in the last uh, the 20 years, uh, the Japanese part-time workers' ratio continued to rise. And that was uh, uh, the factor for the, uh, the, the negative factor to the average wage, uh, as you can see by the right-hand chart. But uh, now, or the, the due to the, the severe labor shortage, or the finally, or the companies, or the started to shift or the from part-time workers to full-time workers, and the, the full-time workers, uh, the uh, the year changes uh, accelerated or the significantly, and uh, the part-time workers ratio or the stopped or the to rise, and uh, as a result, uh, the right-hand chart uh, shows the, uh, the average wages or uh, the turned to positive or uh, the, the basically, and from now on, or uh, I think. Or the, without the, the pressure from the government, without the, uh, the tax incentive, or the, I think the, the Japanese uh, the wages uh, the can go up uh, the further uh, the, because the, uh, the, uh, the we cannot uh, the solve the, uh, the, uh, the problem of uh, the labor shortage or the due to the aging population. Okay, Shirakawa, before you answer, if I could just say. Um, I think, uh, and forgive me, Peter, if I'm wrong here, but we're not concerned just with rising costs and inflation in the U.S. I mean, if, if the Trump um, torpedo leads to retaliation in the EU, possibly in Japan, possibly in China, we could see an escalating series of tariff rises. So in your worst-case scenario, <laughs> what could be the sort of global impact, do you think? Um, Um, well, this I think tariff war um, uh, will end up with a sort of ugly outcome if the tariff war uh, involves uh, counter actions by the other countries. But the um, for the United States, it, it doesn't necessarily a bad thing because the just it is to restrict imports. And theoretically, that is leading to more domestic production. Theoretically, that is leading to higher income. And that could pay for short-term rise in import increases. But it's very nationalistic. I think the issue is, what is the reaction function of the, this government? I think, very simply speaking, the administration seems to be much more interested in their own country's interest rather than the global economic interest. And I think the, you know, we are now only talking about iron, steel, and a bit of the aluminium and so forth. But our point is, if you take a look at the um, domestic, um, uh, sorry, the global investment position, uh, investment uh, or the production capacity, I think the starting 2000, around 2000, because of the WTO and because of the significant in investment increase in China. Emerging economy share of the domestic G uh, of GDP in the global economy jumped around 2000 and then continued to go up. So in the industrial nations, uh, investment GDP share continues to decline. So now, emerging countries produce and we buy things. But our problem is what? Aging population. 
want to produce things rather than buying things because our buying power is going down. So I, I, I don't say Trump is right, but the point is, for the industrial nation in general, there's an incentive to produce and invest and improve per capita GDP because we are now aging. We want, you know, our consumption economy is not necessarily picking up from here. So if you take a look at IMF chart, chart like investment GDP, emerging economies like this, and the destinations like this. Trump wants to dis come back a bit. Um, I think they may be stealing some from, the United States, uh, from, from China, maybe. It does not necessarily make sense because trade, trade uh, you know, should, have, should definitely affect the global GDP. But from, from the American people's perspectives, I don't necessarily say it is, doesn't make sense. It makes some sense. So this is a trade issue. So, and we also, that, you know, we, we haven't done any specific report targeting this trade friction. Uh, on, on, on the wage side, uh, I think the, again, because of being economist, we tend to look at real rather than nominal. And real wage growth in Japan, uh, if you use the GDP deflator, is roughly speaking, per hour real wage growth right now is ab about 0 0.7, 0 0.8%. Slightly lower than productivity growth, but not necessarily hugely lower than productivity growth. So if you want to see a pickup in wage level, you want to see, you have to see pickup in productivity growth is one thing. If you do, an, if you do not expect productivity growth to go up, and, and still you want to see wage growth increases, you want to see labor share going up. So profit share goes down. So what Abesan is saying is that, why don't you do pay more workers without productivity gains is what? Okay, you, you, have, you have to accept lower profit share in GDP. You have to accept higher labor share in GDP at the sacrifice of lower productivity share in GDP. I don't think it does, it does make really real sense to corporate executives, for first of all, and also, the very important thing is Japanese workers are not requesting high wage growth. My case is the same. Job security is more important. And people know their productivity. My sense, it's a bit cultural story, but I think the current 20s and 20 years 20s, I mean, in terms of age, back in four years ago, different. Working hard, continue to contribute to corporate profitability pro and so forth. Current people not necessarily that case. Go home early, drink at home, and life has to be happy, not spending much time in works. They're happy with the current level of, the, of, of wage in my understanding. They're more interested in job security. They are not, their bargaining is quite weak still. So productivity is one story. The other story is people are not necessarily uh, pushing hard the companies to raise wage level. Because AI into the future, 8 million jobs will be lost, even in Japan only, because of AI and so forth. How are you gonna, you know, only thing is, okay, you're gonna sack the guy sitting next to me and pay me more. That makes sense. But this is not Japan. Everybody likes job security. We're gonna keep this size of employment forever and so forth. So the wage story, we are, we are, we are still <laughs> saying maybe 1% wage growth is, is the case. Okay, there was one more question which is about are we looking at another plaza record? And if so, who will be at the table next time? Uh, the possibility, of course, is, is more on China. I'm not China, China, Chinese economist, but uh, if you take a look at the Chinese uh, surplus to the US, and in terms of the US trade deficit with, with, with China, in terms of their GDP, of course, China is the biggest uh, 
uh, I think, the contributor to the U.S. trade deficit. Uh, and if you take a look at the IMF PPP uh, number, uh, it's kind of an astonishing number, like 3.5 something yuan to dollar. Currently, 6.3 something, right? One, two, or three. So, but I, um, I, I don't say that, that that would happen again for Japan, but I think the one possibility, of course, is China. But uh, we are not making such a kind of call uh, as a firm. Uh, oh, sorry. But, uh, well, okay, uh, but we do have a question here first. Let's. Uh, okay. All right. Well, I think I think for 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 China, I, I'm not China China expert, but I think that after the their annual um, not not annual, I think the every five years, you know, the conference. Um, Chinese government has, has become much, much more interested in quality of growth rather than sort of quantity. They are not chasing the economic growth. They are more interested in per capita GDP, for example. And they would like to see more consumption growth or productivity growth. And I'm not familiar with this tax cut story, uh, but the point is the uh, Chinese authorities have become uh, much more sort of cynical about their economic situation. I was quite su uh, surprised to, to listen, uh, so to read the, their statement that our per capita GDP is still nine thousand dollar. Even 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 our economy is second biggest in, in the world, and nine thousand dollar annual, uh, or the, you know the uh, per capita GDP uh, for Japan's case that was uh, ninety eighty or seventy nine. So still they're lagging more or less like 40 years behind Japan. And why Japan could improve their per capita GDP is because we did significant improvement in terms of the um, made in Japan in the 80s. Sony and uh, uh, you know, Toyota and so forth. So China is now very much interested in China made things. And that tax cut, I don't know, uh, maybe you know, relating to that a bit, but um, uh, I, I do not think that is to stimulate the economy, but to probably improve productivity and maybe their focus is more on the side of the how they're going to uh, increase a share of the global markets by selling their own products. That is needed for their GDP, per capita GDP to, to go up. If they are st still the global factories, very difficult for, for them to improve per capita GDP. Uh, so we are not that interested in China's economic growth rate, uh, in particular in, in, in nominal terms, but real terms are important, but per capita is much more important. Siegfried Nittel, freelancer from Germany. Um, I think Brian and um, um, BOJ President Kuroda, if you'll get a second, a second term as, a, as a, a president of the BOJ. But the thing, some people say he has now to think about, about ending or reducing buying government bonds. I think um, many people I will say, um, the the low uh, um, the uh, rate of interest uh, the the rate of the of the Japanese yen uh, is um, depends on on the on the uh, buying the government bonds uh, to to uh, not to buy longer government bonds will mean means uh, increase of the of the yen. What does this mean for the Japanese uh, companies? Uh, not it's not the success of the Japanese companies a result of the of a, of a kind of a, uh, the quantities easing, easing, easing program. And is it, uh, to, to end the quantities easing program, does it not mean um, difficulties for the Japanese industry? Okay, Sakagami-san, please, first. Yep. Uh, the first thing, as you know, uh, the 
the BOJ has already uh, shifted uh, the, uh, the policy target uh, the, from the, uh, the quantitative easing or the, to the, the yield curve control officially. Uh, and uh, as a result, uh, the, in the last year, uh, actually the BOJ has already started to reduce the amount to purchase uh, the JGBs. Uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, the last year's uh, the result uh, was uh, the much smaller uh, than the, the target level of 80 trillion yen. And, uh, so that, that means, uh, that I think, the, the, uh, at the beginning of the monetary easing, uh, the, the quantitative easing would have worked. The, but the, the now, uh, the, the, uh, the quantitative easing uh, would not be uh, uh, the big factor uh, the, for the, the currency and also the, the, uh, the equity price. Uh, and um, so, the, but um, of course, uh, the the BOJ's announcement or the would have uh, uh, the announcement effect or the, the to the market. So the, if uh, the BOJ or the suddenly announces or the to or the stop uh, the to buy or the JGBs, or the, that would be a big problem of the either Japan or the equity market, and uh, equities uh, would be sold off uh, and uh, yen or the, would appreciate. But um, I think the yield, as far as the BOJ keeps the yield curve control and uh, reduce the amount to buy JGBs gradually, uh, that, that would not uh, be a big issue or the, to the equity market uh, and or the, uh, the the currency. Yeah, I think um, the, um, the the markets actually have been concerned about the um, Kuroda's statement in the Parliament uh, um, last Friday that he said um, um, if two percent inflation becomes visible, um, we're gonna you know by you know that time we're gonna definitely think about exit strategy. What is the exit strategy? And this is again the problem with the central bank. This is the central bank's bureaucracy and central bank's language. And there's no definition of the exit. For example, what is the exit? It's not do it like that, right? Exit, in the very narrowly defined exit, is going back before QQE was introduced uh, April 13. Means what? No negative interest policy, no income control policy, no huge printing of money. But I think he didn't mention that. Uh, his exit strategy uh, on, on Friday may be related to the end of current yield curve control policy. And the one tricky thing for the central bank policy is even after stopping the control of the interest rate of, of, of 10 year, monetary base could continue to grow. So we, the, the, for the central bank's policy, different variables, monetary base, short-term interest rates, or the negative interest rates, and long-term interest rates now. But monetary base is no longer official target. But it should continue to grow even after they scrap YCC, income control policy. And the exit strategy he mentioned on Friday seems to relate to YCC, yield curve control policy, rather than monetary base. Because monetary base has to continue to grow even after 2% is reached. Even their optimistic base case scenario, 2% can be reached maybe by the end of fiscal 19, means March 20, means maybe even after March 20, one year of the monetary base expansion means if your definition exit is monetary base uh, outstanding stop growing, that should be 21, 22. So taking long, long time, but I think the market is always far looking, wow, exit, and their reaction is a bit of the appreciation side of the yen. And uh, I tend to think again, you know, at, in my presentation I said BOJ's normalization of monetary policy is now affecting the currency pricing. But a bank Japan, the wishful thinking is US rates going up, economy is okay, and everything would be okay. Yeah, will not strengthen to 90 yen to dollar and so forth. But again, you know, good companies of Japan can survive even maybe 100 yen to dollar. So now the so-called uh, break-even exchange rate, uh, according to the cabinet office survey, uh, for, for car industry, maybe 99 yen to dollar, or roughly speaking, 100. 
So current level is quite OK. The, the issue is maybe if it goes down to 95 or 97, uh, people may start to shout more loudly. Uh, OK, well, again, my apologies for attempting to cut you off early. Um, the final half hour has gone very, very quickly um, because it was a very stimulating debate. Uh, there's more to be said. Um, please come back again and speak to us. And let me give you, if I may, um, honorary memberships, Mr. Sakaki uh, Sakakiyama first. On one year, honorary membership to the club. Please come back again and join us. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much.